This is chapter four, lesson two, experiments for AP Stats. Um, so let's talk first about the difference between an observational study and an experiment. Uh, in an observational study, you're just observing and collecting data and measuring variables of interest, but you're not attempting to influence them. You're not uh, imposing any treatment on them. You're not changing anything and trying to see the effect of changing something and not changing it. Whereas in an experiment, you're deliberately imposing a treatment on individuals to measure a response. So you're, you're changing something in order to see uh, cause and effect. Let's talk about why an experiment's preferable first. So in uh, November 2009, uh, a magazine, Nutrition Action, discussed what the current research tells us about benefits of soy. So for a long time, scientists have believed that soy foods and Asian diets explain the lower rates of breast cancer, prostate cancer, osteoporosis, heart disease uh, in places such as China and Japan. Um, so they conducted some experiments and soy either had no effect or a very small effect on the health of the participants. So several different studies randomly assigned elderly women to either soy or placebo and none of the studies showed that soy was more beneficial for preventing osteoporosis. So we're not quite sure what explains the differences. Maybe there's other differences in food, maybe culture, maybe genetics. However, studies seem to indicate that, but an experiment proved that that wasn't the case. So another common example you might hear about is when there's a study for a pharmaceutical company. Um, and they would have two groups, randomly assign people to two groups using chance or table D or a random number generator. Uh, treatment would be one drug tested and a placebo would be the other. Now they compare the two groups to see if there's an improvement. Um, so that's the general idea of an experiment. You're changing something. We're trying to isolate one cause and its effect. Now that's the hard part because often there's many causes and there may be things lurking called lurking variables that we're not sure about. Uh, so in another example here, um, observational studies linked uh, hormones to reducing the risk of heart attack in women. So people decide to have an experiment and women were randomly assigned to one of two groups, so random assignment's a key of experiments. Um, and by a coin flip, one group received hormones and the other group received dummy pills, um, which is important to prevent the placebo effect, where people um, may think they're getting better and get better just because they think they're taking a pill. So having a placebo pill accounts for that. Um, different things that could pop up in this. Age and hospital visits per year could be lurking variables, meaning they could be variables the study hasn't accounted for and are affecting the responses. So you could account for that um, with blocking, which we'll talk about in just a second, where we separate uh, the women into two categories of or two age groups, for example, and then you randomly assign from there for a total of four groups. That way you can compare younger women and their results on the two groups to older women in their two groups and see if there's a difference there. So once this experiment, these experiments were conducted, uh, they agreed that hormone replacement did not reduce the risk of heart attack um, and these treatments declined in popularity. It turned out that the reason, uh, the lurking variables that were mainly affecting it were income and level of education. Women who had more income, so money to spend, and were more educated were taking more home hormones. So they ended up having better health because they had better education, perhaps knew how to eat better, um, and had more money, so perhaps had more access to equipment for working out and that sort of thing. So those would be lurking of variables. Variables that we haven't accounted for in our study that are affecting the response variable we're trying to measure. And this is an example of confounding. So confounding occurs when we can't figure out we can't distinguish the effects of two or more variables from each other. We don't know whether um, income or level of education or the hormones um, are the reason that there was a reduced risk of heart attack in that case. Now after the experiments we found that it wasn't the hormones. Um, we still know there's income and level of education. Those were the confounding variables that made us think that it was the hormones that were doing it. So. In observational studies, we often have confounding, meaning we have other things happening, other variables that we haven't accounted for that are causing a response variable. So the women in this experiment were um, the experimental units. However, when we have experimental units that are humans, we call them subjects. Remember that a treatment is just a, a combination of specific values for our explanatory variable or whatever we think the cause is. And each experiment should 
identify one explanatory variable to test and try to isolate it so it's just that variable. So in the, in the case we just talked about, the one that you can see on your screen, hormones and dummy pills, or the two treatments. Those are the two specific values they had. You could either get a hormone or a dummy pill. Um, other explanatory variables should be tested in other experiments and you want to prevent confounding. Now if we have um, two different groups that we're testing these things on and they differ greatly, for example, there's more men in one group and more women in another, or in the previous example, if we had had more old, older women in the dummy placebo group and we had younger women in the hormone group, then we, we often have confounding. So, in order to prevent this, we use random assignment. Now, random assignment is very important. We've talked about random sampling. Random sampling allows us to apply our, the results of our study or experiment to the greater population. Since we're doing it randomly, randomly pulling uh, people from a population or individuals from a population, we are likely to have a representative sample, meaning our sample and the breakdown of our sample is comparable to that of the population. So an SRS, a simple random sample, allows us to, to infer our results to the greater population. Random assignment lets us figure out cause and effect since it accounts for lurking variables. So if I have a group of P individuals and I use some sort of random number generator, table D, or my calculator, however I randomly assign them and I assign them to different groups randomly, then we should have those lurking variables accounted for because uh, we likely have even numbers of older women and younger women in this example, in our two groups. So random assignment lets you infer cause and effect, meaning you know what the, the cause, the explanatory variable is, and the effect, the response variable. SRS, a simple random sample, lets you apply the results you gain from your sample to the greater population. So key principles of an experimental design. You want to control for lurking variables that might affect the response variable. So you need a systematic way to compare two groups so you can be sure the results are caused by the treatment that you imposed. Remember, whatever you're changing for the two groups, so the hormone, the dummy pill, and not lurking variables like age, like hospital visits could have been in our previous example. So you're controlling things so that we can just isolate one cause and see if that has an effect. Uh, another, the second principle of experimental design, randomly assign experimental units to treatments. We just talked about random assignment. That lets us infer cause and effect. So we use chance to assign the groups. It makes roughly equivalent groups that likely mirror the characteristics of the population. The larger our sample size, the more likely that is because um, chance will determine that our two groups are more likely to mirror the population. It, it's a very small chance of having a group that doesn't look like the population if we have a large sample size because we're pulling so many people. This also balances for the effect of lurking variables, meaning other variables that are causing a change in our explanatory variable, whatever our effect is that we haven't accounted for. Uh, and finally, the third is replication. Use enough experimental units, um, a big enough sample size, to distinguish the effect and treatments from just chance variation. So what that means is if we pulled five people from a population, we could have five people that don't represent the population. I could have pulled five people, like in the previous example, that were all over 65. Um, and then that wouldn't give me a good, that doesn't represent the way the population is. The population isn't all people over 65. But the larger that number gets, the less likely we are to pull all people from one part of the population. So our sample is more representative the larger it gets. Um, in your next assignment for response bias, your minimum number of responses is going to be 50. So 25 for each of your two ways you're asking your question to help account for chance variation. So we talked about some things that can go wrong. Um, so if we were to give people in that example, the hormone example, uh, a pill and one group got nothing, they would know that they're not on the hormone um, and then that might affect our results. They might feel worse as a, res as a result or they might change how they feel because they know they're not getting the treatment. Maybe they're disappointed about that. They didn't get put in that group. For that reason, we use placebos, meaning uh, dummy pills. Um, so placebo effect always has to be accounted for. Now, an interesting thing is that the placebo effect often needs to be uh, happening with the person delivering the pills too, meaning the doctor that or whoever's giving the pill to the uh, to the 
uh, subject in this case shouldn't know either. We call that double blinding, where the person giving the treatment and the person receiving the treatment don't know. So maybe the statistician has um, already assigned all the, the bags of pills and they all look the same, and the statistician knows that I gave this person the placebo, but the person who actually delivers it to the patient doesn't. That's double blinding, where both the person who's giving it to the subject or to the experimental unit and the person uh, who's receiving it, neither one of them know if they've got the placebo or not. So statistical significance is what we're looking for. So meaning that we have an effect that's large enough that it would rarely occur by chance. Um, so in class, we talked about your heartbeat, and we were looking for a difference between sitting and standing. That was our treatment. And trying to see, um, is there a big enough difference there that it couldn't have occurred by chance? Um, and that's after we've isolated and tried to remove all lurking variables that we could have. So um, that's statistical significance. Uh, we're going to be going into that throughout the entire year. Now, earlier I mentioned blocking. So a block is a group of units in our experiment that we know they have some similarity, and we expect that to affect our response. We expect that to affect our results. So we're going to go ahead and account for that by separating those people from the sample into two groups. So it's different from stratified random sampling since this is for experiments, and it occurs um, before our random assignment to the groups. So before our assignment, we split them up into two groups, and then we randomly assigned the treatment, the two different treatments, or it could be more than two treatments. So we separate them into blocks depending on the characteristic that we think is going to affect the block. So a randomized block design, the random assignment is carried out separately within each block. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So we're testing a new laundry detergent in order to determine if it removes stains more effectively in cold or hot water. Um, so we think that the color of the clothing may affect this outcome. Like we think that maybe whites this might work well for than darks. So we separate our sample. So in this case we have units of clothes. We separate lights and darks. And then, um, and then we randomly assign them to treatment and non-treatment. So it's not random. It depends on a characteristic. In this case the color of the clothing. We separate into light clothing. Then we separate into dark clothing. Then we randomly assign. And it, looks like, and it looks like this right here. We start off with many pieces of dirty laundry. We separate them by their co the characteristic of, clo of color into light and dark. And then we go through random assignment um, and randomly assign some to cold and randomly assign some to hot water. Now, in this case, that might account for a lurking variable of the type of fabric. Maybe that also affects it, and that could help account for that. Um, but right now, we only know that dark and light, co dark and light color is what uh, we're blocking for. So this is a block design. We separate. It's not random here. It's dependent on light and dark clothing. Then we randomly assign to cold and hot water. We can compare the cleanliness of light colored clothing and the cleanliness of dark colored clothing. A uh, final type of design we have to discuss is a match pairs design in which we control for lurking variables by matching pairs of similar experimental units and or, or the same and using chance to decide which member gets of a pair gets which treatment. So in class we, uh, we did this, and we did a very good way of doing it um, by having you test your own heartbeat standing and your own heartbeat sitting. Now, that can account for lurking variables. Some people mentioned athletes may have lower uh, heart rate. Um, somebody might be a, drink more caffeine than another person. Somebody just genetically might have some predisposition. So by comparing you to yourself, we account for a number of those lurking variables. Um, so a matched pairs design it's like we, we pair up based on some, something similar, some similarity, and then we can pair within each pair. We see how the treatment works for each pair because we think that um, they're more comparable as a result of their similarities. So here's your multiple choice question. The community intervention trial for smoking cessation, meaning quitting smoking, asked whether a community-wide advertising campaign would reduce smoking. The researchers located 11 pairs of communities, each pair similar in location, size, economic status, and so on. One community in each pair participated in the advertising campaign and the other did not. This is A, an observational study, B, a matched pairs experiment, C, a completely randomized experiment, D, a randomized block design but not matched pairs, or E, a stratified random sample. Uh, read over Chapter 4, Lesson 2, and especially focus on the summary on 252. To get more background and help, there's also a couple more examples in there of block design matched pairs. Um, keep in mind, a simple random sample gives us 
uh, inference the population. Ran, um, random assignment gives us cause and effect. 